Hey, Hans. Hey, man. Hey, where's your hat? Well, one sec. And... Ba-da! Sombrero. Why'd you ask me to bring a hat? <laughs> so, well, because you're eating it fat, so... Remember what you said about Flight of the Icarus, Jason? Well, oh. it's time to eat it because the creator of the skill is actually here and you have some serious explaining to do, man. So, in a way, this is a metaphor for the skill. I think the skill is trying to fly too close to the sun and they got burned, but, uh, try it again. Shit, you got Tom to come on the show? Yeah, we got Tom on the show. Huh, Tom saw what we did. We talked about the scale. He didn't like what you said about it. So now he's, you know, he's on the show for round two of Flight of the Icarus. What, what made you come up with this scale and what's the story behind it? So, yeah, I, I mean, I've been a developer for um, quite a few years now, um, mainly doing non-entertainment things. Uh, but I've always wanted to make games. Uh, unfortunately, I've never had the, uh, the artistic skills, we'll say, to to create anything you know for the the computer or something like that i've had a go but they, they've never worked out um and then with alexa i thought well here's a great opportunity now where i can do something where i don't have to worry necessarily about art uh, and it just needs to be story driven um one of my friends is he's always had a really sort of creative imagination uh, so i reached out to him and said hey you know let's make a game together you come up with the story I'll do the coding and uh, we'll see what we'll see what we come up with. And um, yeah, we had a phone call and we just talked about what you could do with Alexa and what the capabilities were. And then mm -hmm. uh, he went off and, and came up with a story and we we worked from there. And then Flight of the Icarus, because you wanted to create games before, then Flight of the Icarus was never a game you fought off or maybe a different interface that now voice gave you the opportunity to do or just your friend came up with that story now? Yeah, he came up with a story uh, based on the capability, the capabilities that we had available to us. So I said, you know, can we do something that's purely voice based? Um, and when we talked about the fact that you don't, I know some devices have a screen, but you don't necessarily have a screen. His whole idea there was, all right, well, the story will be based on something where your character can't actually see to really try and immerse you into that experience. Um yeah, and that, that's how it came about, really. A lot of his influences of both of us is, you know, we were interested in in um, sci-fi and, you know, things like Horizon, Event Horizon, um, and old mysteries is, is what he liked, things like the Mary Celeste and games like Prey and Half-Life. Um, and, and that's where it came from there. And, yeah, it just it blossomed out of that and we, we just worked together. through it. But how long did it take from, from you calling your friends like, hey, you want to do this and come up with something to actually launching this thing? It was probably, it probably happened over about a six month period, but both of us were only working on this in the evenings when and where we yeah. could. So it's not like, you know, that was six months full out. It was the odd evening here and there where you could um, and, and some weekends and where we could, this was, I mean, it was released quite a while ago where we could, we'd meet up and, and try and go through it together um, like that as well. So yeah, a lot of it was just done collaboratively. Um, we came up with a good system of how to lay out the story. And then there were a couple of iterations to begin with after we had the first chapter written where I worked through things and then I was, you know, typical, typical coder. I was like, oh, this isn't going to work here. I'm going to have to start from scratch how some of this logic works. Um, and yeah, and yeah, it just, it slowly evolved chapter by chapter. Uh, when you create these chapters, what do they look like? Is it like a happy path for the user? What does this, uh, a chapter in this look like? Is it a flow chart? So I, I sort of had two pieces uh, that my, my friend put together um, for the story. So we had the script um, and then it was, we broke it up into chapters, sections and stages. So you might have chapter one, section one, stage one. And then literally as you go, I had a spreadsheet as well that mapped up everything you could do at each point. So as a spreadsheet that said, right, for chapter one, section one, stage one, this is the prompt. These are the answers that we would expect someone to give at that point. If, they, if they're expected to say yes or no, it might be right. Yes jumps you to chapter two, section one, stage one. Or if they say no, it goes elsewhere. And then there was a general fallback that could catch something where the user said something that they're not expected to say. 
Um, so it could then perhaps provide a helpful prompt or say, um, you know, Eve command unclear or something like that. I'm curious about the fallback, the error message, because you said you have one error message in the, in the experience. Yeah. So the, the idea is that you're stuck in this suit called an Eve suit um, where the only way you can interact with it is your voice and it only has a certain number of commands. So I think it is explained in uh, one of the initial bits that this suit you could normally command, you know, normally as a, a functioning human, but in this case, you can't because you've only got, because of the power outages, you can only use your voice to do it. So it has these very limited commands. So the general fallback was um, command unclear because it might be that command hasn't been activated or it's not really something you can do in the area that you're in. There is the ability there. And I think there might be some cases where you actually get a more descriptive error message. Um, no. So the, the main commands that you've got available to you are list, um, list commands, describe, move. Um, you've got yes and no's and use. And how, how it's broken down in the code actually is that at each level, you can override those commands. So if someone says it and they're in a particular stage, like 1.1.1, I could have some code that can run based on, on that particular stage, based on that command. If it doesn't find it at that level, it can jump up to the level above it and say, right, wow. at 1.1, have I got something that I can use here? And then if it hasn't, it can jump up to the chapter level and then fall back to something there. And then above that, there was a main whole story level that has those commands. So it can always fall back to the tree to where it can find a response to, to serve to the user. Um, and that, that helped with um, some bits where you had the same response, the further you got further and down, I didn't have to define it at every single level. It could be defined a lot higher up. So, so these things in terms of these types of architecture, was that already when you first started designed in a way or, or is that stuff that you already you know as you went through this process of creating this entire map and this spreadsheet stumbled upon that problem that you needed to no so it, it, it was as i started it so as i previously mentioned i'd started writing it one way and then as as my friend was providing more parts of the story and i was going through i was like oh, actually this isn't going to work here because i won't be able to tie things up so it was a uh, i guess the architecture there evolved as the story evolved and then I realized more things that I'd have to do. And, and the way the story's written, actually everything that you see and hear all ties in and then ultimately leads to the, the culmination at the end. So everything that he wrote was very specific that he wanted you to, to hear. So I had to make sure I could tie it all in in a, in a good way. Um, but even myself, I, I was... <laughs> I was really surprised how, well, not surprised, but how good the story was sort of reading it through. And I, you know, it's, it's my skill. So you are sort of protective of it, but just reading it through myself the, the first time I was like, you know, this is, this is great. Actually, I really liked it. So um, yeah, yeah, I, I, mean, I wanted writing, to do it justice. Uh, yeah. The, the writing was really cool. I very much enjoyed that. And I think what's interesting is that as you developed the story, Technically, it was a very iterative process where you like, all right, no, how do I do it justice, etc. Where on the design side of it, uh, you could have also brought in a test panel already of people talking through the script to make some of those finer points where sometimes it's a bit too long and, and there is some confusion with people when they interact with it. It's sort of you, the, the process of iteration and including people and testing it very quickly for each layer was done on the technical side. Uh, and, and not so much possibly on the human side. So I'm very interested like what the testing process with, with the audience what was like or, or if it was there. Obviously, me and my friend, we were both testing it as we were going through. So every time I'd sort of finished a chapter uh, or even more than that, I'd be like, look, I've done some new bits or added this new type of functionality in there go off and test it and we both test it and with this spreadsheet we try and make sure that every avenue the user could take they got an appropriate response um but like discoverability i think testing is quite hard um again because this was something we did as a sort of you know a hobby in our spare time yeah. um i had uh, i had another close friend who's got uh, who's got an alexa device so tried to get him to test it but for some reason he would never receive the invite um, and then there was a few other people that I worked with that had devices so I reached out to them and said can you test this uh, I gave them access and, and some of them did um, and they'd give feedback and yeah we we try and 
try and work on that. And, you know, I'd go back to my friend who wrote a story and said, look, someone's had issues here. Can we, can we work on that? And we would, but we didn't have a huge pool of testers. Um, and again, even some of the people I reached out to a couple of them, I don't think even tested it at all, even though I sort of tried to prompt them three or four times, like, look, can you test this? Can you test this? <laughs> um, and it sort of, it never happened. In fact, one of them, I think when I was around their house, I enabled the skill on their device. Um, and I still don't think they tested it. But, um, that's an amazing story because you know how many friendships, how many friendships I've lost because I've had asked people to test my skills or to test my chatbots. And after a while, you just start losing friends and family. They just start stop answering emails and they're just like, no, man, I don't want to talk to your chatbot anymore. Just leave me alone. So I under, totally understand where you're coming from on this time. We did, we did do one session where um, uh, me and the, the story writer, we got together with one of our uh, common friends and we just sat there with a pen and paper and we said, right, this is, you know, go. And we literally just watched him play through the whole story, making notes. And um, I, I think there were bits at the start, like uh, the incident in your original video where he tried to interrupt, where I sort of say like, you know, can you hear me? Um, and he tried to say yes, but it, you know, Alexa wasn't ready to receive a response at that time. Um, so we knew the intro was quite long, but we did want to try and immerse people into that skill and then yeah, really set the scene it's a, it's a trade-off right it's, it's always tricky one of the things that, that we like to do when we uh test things out is even before you build anything so next time if you would have the whole story in the spreadsheet you could actually just ask the neighbor or your wife to just they can speak freely and you just read what you have on the spreadsheet all right, you just read it out yourself. And then with some of these things, because then when you see someone, they're like, hey, that's, that's confusing, or they freeze up because they can't process all the information. Uh, you, you get that feedback very quickly before even doing it, building anything yourself and then doing the testing of that. So you, there, you could even have a, a, it's called Wizard of Oz test, where the other people just speak freely and, and you just stick to the script. That's a, that's a great point, actually. And, uh, yeah, definitely bear that bear that in mind if we, uh, if we make anything else. We, we did have to do a sort of verbal run through, I think, of the last chapter because that, that wasn't quite ready. But um, now that one of the guys we tested with, he did say, actually, the more he got used to the commands that he could use, the sort of easier the flow became. Um, and again, that was sort of the reason for the long intro because the whole idea was that first chapter is really just introducing you to the commands that you can mm. use to try and get someone just at that stage where they're they're comfortable with it and i think that just comes from playing games where you have those initial bits where you're learning everything but in hindsight yeah maybe for voice it doesn't work as well because you are just sitting there for up to four minutes listening to someone yeah. ramble on it, it, it's a bigger pro like because you can definitely imagine like if i go to the game at a store and i buy like a, a a board game type thing and i read the instruction or i have a screen and then i have the voice talking me through it then you know it could be a really cool experience, like the combination of, of voice to with other games, or, or just having the voice and animation on the screen. But yeah, just listening to someone for four, five minutes, like I was, I was, you know, I got bored in class as a teenager, <laughs> quickly listening to teachers as well. I can't even find my own skills. Nobody can find your skills. How do you get your skill promoted? How do you get your skill out there? How do you get people to test your skill or not test your skill, uh, use your skill? Uh, and a Another question is, how many people ended up using it or playing with it? Looking at the last, last time I looked at the stats, there was over 600 uh, enablements. A large, I think over 570 or something, had actually interacted with the skill of that. So some people just seem to enable skills and never use them. Uh, no idea who those people are. Um, <laughs> <to walk out. laughs> yeah, and then um, I can't remember the exact sort of number of interactions, but that's obviously quite higher than the the actual uh, individual users um i've and again I, you know i've no idea what what constitutes a good a good engagement rate with alexa skills um I, although i've got the stats of my stuff yeah, yeah. Uh, i've no idea what the level is to receive any kind of developer rewards or anything like that but uh yeah what about uh, I mean, monetization? Me like, oh. being, being honest, uh, 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 yeah, you, want, you want to talk monetization? Yeah. Does it, does it Money. make you a millionaire, Tom? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. Short answer, no. Um, <laughs> I mean, mon monetization was, um, it was never in our mind. Um, 
I, I knew about the developer rewards program, but this this really was just me and my friends. We've always done creative things together when when we were younger, and this was almost sort of a bit of a throwback to that to us making something that we wanted to make for ourselves. Um, if it made some money down the line, great, but that that was never the end goal. It was always about the story, and I think while we were writing it they did have one of those Alexa skills competitions, which was all about in skill purchases. And I thought, Oh, is there something we could do here to put them, put them in. But when we talked about it, it was like, no, it would just, it would just ruin the story trying to ham something in there to get people to buy something It was, you know, you yeah. you'd suddenly come out of the immersion to say, Oh, would you like to buy a hint or something like that? And it was just, we didn't want to do that for the, for the sake of the story. We, uh, we, we have tested, some of these skills that that did have that uh, that that paywall and those paid features, but it just it was so a turn off. Like, like it was really like you're on an adventure. It was very immersive, and then oh yeah, you want to proceed? Spend money or give us details. I was like, yeah, that doesn't feel right. And I think it is being like with 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 conversations. Like once people are involved in a conversation, it is so immersive and it, it you know it really triggers parts of your brain that it just is it's so cool and natural and that's what makes this space so exciting but then if you sort of you know then turn it into a commercial thing uh it's almost it, it almost launches you into the uncanny valley where it just doesn't make sense anymore where you're like hey i thought i was part of a story and now you're charging me again it's yeah, it's, it's, it's such a big problem to solve, I guess, for everybody. It's like, first you get discovered, and then how the hell are you going to make some money out of it? Uh, it? And it's just so... But it's so much fun to create. That's always the the, the, <laughs> the other side of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think there's a place for uh, some skills to be monetized, but, it, yeah, it really depends on the, the niche and, and what you're doing there. And I, I guess it really makes sense probably in a lot more of uh, skills that are built on top of another... Uh, skill that you've got on another uh, another app you've got on another device you know with account linking or something like that so actually it's more of a tied ecosystem thanks for hopping on a call with us tom because i think like we you know we always you know talk about voice skills but it's never really we always get excited about people actually putting themselves out there and creating these things for people to interact with but we hardly ever talk to the people that that create these things so it's, it's really fun to to hear your story and and i think everybody can sort of learn from from your experience of, of how you've developed so i guess final question then is like how do you what are the next steps now for flight of the icarus what's 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 the one year roadmap or, or six months as a final message I made one change since it was launched um and that was to introduce apla when that came out so uh, we had a few bits initially in the skill where i would pre-recorded using the simulator what alexa was saying so that i could put it in an audio file um, because you had a limit of five audio tracks that you could play at a time. Um, and because of some of the dialogue, that made it quite awkward. But then if you were in the, say, US locale, you'd hear the uh, GB version of Alexa speak in those sort of cutscenes. So with APLA, I've gone back and reworked it all so that you actually hear the proper voice for your locale when you're talking. Um, in terms of going forward with the, the skill, there isn't anything on the, the roadmap at the moment because the, so the story sort of completed itself um i'd love to make something else but um my friend works for the nhs so he's extremely uh extremely busy at the moment the uh the story writer <laughs> no i mean I, i'd love to make something else um i always wanted to try and do different things that you know where you interact with alexa slightly differently so um yeah i had ideas where you were interacting with alexa on a screen before they sort of um, announced the web API for games and stuff like that. And I, I built a few little prototypes of things like that. Um, but yeah, I've got a few ideas for other skills, but they're um, not as involved, I guess, as, as last flight of the Icarus and they're in, uh, in different niches, but uh, yeah, I always want to try and do different bits of functionality and see, see what we can really do with Alexa and um, yeah, push the boundaries. If people want to help out or contribute to your projects, how, how do they find you? I did start a little uh, blog on Medium um, just called Alexa Skills Dev. And it was really a dumping ground for myself of as I was learning things rather than sort of constantly um, having to go back and read the docs all the time. I thought, right, I can actually write some of this down and make it useful uh, for other people. Um, and they're, they're not behind the, the paywall there. So 
um, they don't get curated, but I just wanted them to be open for everyone. So uh, yeah, there's a discovery, a discoverability issue with those as well. But uh, yeah, people can people can search that. It's just Alexa Skills Dev on Medium, and then I, I did create a little Facebook group where I just sort of post those um, those articles on there as I post them. And yeah, if people ask questions on there, I try to answer it. So yeah, by all means, people try and find me on there or reach out on LinkedIn or wherever. And um, thanks a lot for having me, guys. All right really appreciate yeah. it this is what it is it's people going out thinking this voice stuff is cool for alexa or google assistant or bixby or whatever and they have a passion project and you know what's great about passion projects these days you can launch them and get people to interact with them and, and really get that feedback so it, it's nice and I'm, I'm very happy that we're celebrating these alexa skill developers here it's so easy today to make a skill on Alexa. He had, he's a developer, but you don't have to be a developer. Anyone can make a skill on Alexa these days, even without uh, having those skills, even without having developing programming skills. I think anybody can create a skill, and that's a, a beautiful thing to yeah. see people create in their spare time, in their downtime, in the weekends, uh, create. Because it's, it's an art form. Ch creating voice bots is an art form. Uh, and I think Tom yeah. is proof of that. Yeah. And, and I hope he continues and whatever he creates, we will support and endorse. And uh, I think there's lots of people, you know, in our design communities that are always looking for projects and building portfolios. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of them get trained and certified. They're like, all right, so what's next? How do I get work? Well, building a portfolio is, is an important step in that. And I think, you know, creating these passion projects and launching them into the world is really the best way to put yourself on the map. And get something going couldn't agree more hans as usual drop in the knowledge drop in the truth the truth all right hans this, this has been great but i have a, i have a lot of hat to eat i don't know what you're doing anymore see you later man <laughs>